So this isn't just my scariest trick-or-treating story. This is the story of the scariest thing that has ever happened to me in my entire life. It's not some dumb story about ghosties or ghoulies or anything supernatural like that. It's something very real and very tangible that left me seriously messed up for a long, long time. My parents arranged counseling sessions for me to help deal with it, and I can't say those didn't help a little, but what happened that Halloween night has stayed with me for my whole life, and every single year, without fail, I think about it a little. Like a lot of suburban neighborhoods here on the east coast of the US, Halloween decorations have become something of an art form. I remember when decorations used to be confined to just a pumpkin and maybe a few things pinned to a front door. But now it's a whole different ball game, with lawns overflowing with orange colored decor and even the occasional roof being covered in those fake spiderweb type things. Things have gotten pretty intense too, like last year I saw how someone had actually dug up a patch of their own well preen front lawn to make like a fake grave type thing that had a skeletal hand sticking out of it. It's been that way for a few years now and it's a key to how my story even happened in the first place. So on the night in question, me and a friend of mine are wandering around our neighborhood in costume, collecting as much candy as we could possibly carry. We come to this one particular house that's totally decked out in all kinds of Halloween themed decorations. I mean, it was honestly pretty impressive how much effort the family had put into it. And if they were so into Halloween that they go to such lengths to decorate their home, there was a decent chance that they'd be incredibly generous with giving out candy too. So me and my buddies started walking up their pathway, all slow, just admiring all the decor as we went. Things got progressively spookier as we went, but nothing could compare to the scene we saw as we got close to the front door, and that buddy of mine spied through the front window of the house. Inside, the entire front room had been turned into a pure vision of hell. This family was indeed the most dedicated set of Halloween decorators we'd ever come across, it appeared that they set up an actual sort of murder scene. The whole room was trashed with ornaments strewn over the room, china plates smashed to smithereens with pieces laying all over the carpet. There was blood everywhere too, splashed all over the couch along the bloody handprints on the walls and in the middle of the room, laying on the carpet, was the most convincing looking dead body I'd ever seen. The family had done a decent job of obscuring the mannequin or whatever it was, by having it pretty much caked in blood and gore-soaked, torn-up clothing. It was maybe a little much for Halloween, though. Like, I've always been something of a scary movie fan, but even I couldn't stomach to look at it for very long, so I moved up to the front door and began ringing the doorbell. I rang once, then twice, but no one answered, and all the while my buddy's just staring through the front window, white as a sheet. I try a third time, banging on the door extra loud just in case the doorbell happened to be broken or something, and still my buddy is just gawking through the front window. I remember him saying something like, God, it just looks so real. Before I finally walk over and start trying to drag him away from the window before he vomited or something, the homeowners would certainly not be giving us any candy if we went and made a big old throw-up mess on their property. Only right as I'm doing so, I happened to look through the window just in time to see one of the TV room doors opening. In walked a man who looked like he'd been crying, like a whole lot too, and in his hand were these big plastic trash bags. We're only peeking in from the edge of the window, so he didn't see us right away, and we watched as he walks over to the mannequin thing and kneels down beside it. He reaches out to touch the face of the thing, and that's when I see how he's got these rubber gloves on too the kind you use for washing up. I get that he didn't want to get any of the corn syrup blood or whatever it was on his hands, and I started kind of wondering how he's going to get the stains out of the carpet. I mean, that's real dedication to ruin your own upholstery all in the name of Halloween decorations. And that's when it hits me. We're not looking at Halloween decorations. The body lying on the carpet isn't a mannequin, and it's not corn syrup on the walls. It's real blood. A real body. We're not looking at a decorative setup, we're looking at an actual murder scene. My buddy says just one word. Dude. Loud enough for the guy inside to hear us. 
His head spins towards the window, these big tear-stained eyes just focusing on the little spot we're peering in from, and the sad look in his eyes turns to one of pure shock and anger. We lock eyes for a moment and I feel my heart rate go into overdrive, a thousand terrified thoughts flashing my mind all at once. Then the man is up on his feet, storming out the TV room and towards what I could only guess was the front door. Me and my buddy just sprint back down the path, running as fast as we can as we hear the front door open up behind us. I look back briefly to see the man, clothes soaked in blood, chasing us out into the dark street. He was bigger than us, faster than us, and had absolutely no intention of letting us get away to report what we'd seen. I can't even describe the kind of fear that I'd felt, knowing it was only a matter of seconds before he caught up with us, and when he did, we'd probably suffer the same fate as whoever it was lying on the carpet back in his house. But as luck would have it, the streets were still pretty busy with trick-or-treaters at that hour and he must have realized that chasing a pair of kids still covered in blood would arouse way too much suspicion. Even if it was Halloween and people might mistake the real blood for fakery, just like we'd done in the first few minutes appearing through the front window. We ran and ran all the way back to my parents' house where we begged them to call the police. At first, my parents figured that our imaginations had just gotten the better of us and dismissed our claims that we'd seen an actual murder scene as pure fantasy. In the end, my dad insisted on seeing the scene for himself before calling the cops out, and even if the idea of going back there sent me into fits of terror, he wouldn't take no for an answer. I had horrible visions of the bloodied man just sticking a shotgun through his front door, and blowing my dad away so that there'd be no witnesses, and the whole walk around the murder house, I was absolutely terrified. But as we got closer, we started to see a bunch of blue flashing lights. It was only then that dad actually took me seriously, and as we edged around a corner and saw a bunch of cop cars sitting outside the murder house, he realized that I'd been telling the truth. I figured someone who saw him chasing us briefly had the wherewithal to call the police before us, and I thank God that they did, because I don't know if I'd even be writing this if we'd actually been able to walk back up that pathway and back towards the house. It was all over the papers for the next few days. How this guy had stabbed his wife to death, and rumors went round that he'd found out that she was cheating or something. But I never really got the it was confirmed or not, so only God knows what actually caused him to snap and murder her. Like I said... I had to have a great deal of therapy throughout my teenage years to help me get over what I saw that night and for a long, long time I saw that body in my nightmares. In the worst of them, me and my buddy would be looking through the window and the body would rise up into a sitting position before the woman screamed to us to help her, blood pouring from her cut up mouth as she did so. In some others, the guy would catch us, drag us back into the house then lay us on the carpet next to the body before taking a knife to us, one at a time. It took a while, but I got past it. Yet Halloween remains a time of year when I can't quite keep those memories out of my head. A time of year when others pretend to be haunted by ghosts and whatnot, whereas I'm actually haunted by the sight of that poor woman, lying on the carpet, covered in blood. I don't know if this is going to scare any adult readers out here, but as a kid, this definitely scared the life out of me. My dad used to take me and my sister trick-or-treating around our neighborhood here in Toronto every year when we were kids, being a chaperone so we didn't get lost or picked on by older kids. He was always good like that, and me and my sister used to share our candy with him when we got home. It was a major dad tax, but we never minded. There's no way I'd have felt safe enough going out of my own on a dark, freezing night, not when I was that age anyway. So this one year, we ended up knocking at a new neighbor's house on Halloween night. They'd only moved in like a week or two before and I don't think my parents had any interactions with them, so I imagine Dad thought that it would be a good idea to knock that night so we could get some candy while he could say hi to the new arrivals. Two birds, one stone and all that. 
But what we didn't know was that these new neighbors were super hardcore Christians and most definitely were not down with the whole spooky Halloween atmosphere. So we knock on their door, the neighbor lady answers and we're all like, trick or treat. Pretty much every single household up until that point had reacted wonderfully, told us how cute we looked in our costumes, given us candy, all that good stuff, but this lady reacts really, really badly and starts telling dad how irresponsible he is for taking us out into the cold on a night like that. A little exchange kicks off between her and dad who politely defends his reasoning, even making a joke about how he got to eat a little candy for himself. The lady just stared at him blankly for a second before she starts screaming all this Bible stuff at us. She had this horrible look of pure anger on her face all twisted up with big furious eyes and she pointed a long bony finger at us. I couldn't remember exactly what she said so I spent a little more time doing research so I could pull up some of the exact quotes that came out of her. Like I said, not totally terrifying for adults and I remember my dad shaking his head and just leading us away from the house. But to me and my sister all the screaming about God and demons and the devil and whatnot just absolutely terrified us and we cried so hard for a while until dad could manage to calm us down. So one of the things that she had said was, abstain from every form of evil. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Which I guess was her implying that you couldn't partake in any spooky fun around Halloween if you really wanted to be a good God-fearing Christian. Another was definitely take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them and give no opportunity to the devil. She screamed that one at us as my dad took us each by the hand and led us away from the house. The final thing we heard before we got out into the open street was, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. I mean, she carried on screaming stuff at us, following us outside and into the streets, as I'm guessing she started ranting at all the other parent and kid teams who were out that night, but I can't really remember what she said after that. I didn't hear over my own sobbing. Dad walked us away until we couldn't hear her anymore, then gave us each a big hug to calm us down, I remember asking him if trick-or-treating made us bad people, but he told us no. That there was no harm in a little bit of spooky fun on Halloween, and that God wouldn't be mad at us for visiting our neighbors or sharing candy with strangers. That kind of thing made people and communities feel closer together, not further apart. The only thing that did push people apart were horrible neighbor ladies who scream scary things at kids and get mad at them when they don't deserve it. All that made us feel much better. Anne calmed us right down, just about in time to knock on a few more houses before we called it a night, heading home to eat ourselves into a diabetes hole in front of a Nightmare Before Christmas movie, which coincidentally is still one of my favorite movies ever. Years went by, but I never forgot about how horrible that neighbor lady was to us that evening, and me and my sister grew to hate her. Y'all might be pretty happy to hear that she used to get the trick side of trick-or-treating quite a lot too, and... It wasn't unusual for my sister and I to head off to school on the morning of November 1st to see them pulling toilet paper out of the tree in their front yard. But anyways, that's definitely the scariest thing that ever happened to me out of all the times I went trick-or-treating during my youth. Maybe that makes me sound a little sheltered, but as I said, I challenge any 11-year-old not to get super creeped out by a lady screaming scary Bible verses in their face on a dark, freezing night like that. I think for any American teenager, starting high school has to be one of the most stressful, daunting experiences of their entire education. But for me, it was particularly rough. You see, I was a real late bloomer, still very much a squeaker by the time I got to be a freshman. While the boys my age were getting growth spurts and sprouting facial hair, I could easily have still passed for like 11 or 12. I mean, I got caught up eventually, don't get me wrong but there are pictures of me from back then that my current roommate has seen and he jokes that I had the body of an anorexic bikini model. 
I'd like to argue to the contrary, but honestly, that's not far off. So unfortunately, I was an obvious target for bullying seniors, the worst of which was this big slab of meat with red hair named Josh. Josh used to push me into lockers on a daily basis like, Are you sure you're old enough to be here, short stuff? And I was in absolutely no position to be able to defend myself. So this goes on for like a month, and each time I get sicker and sicker of how he's treating me. It's not like I was a total pushover either. Despite my small stature, I'd managed to deter any potential middle school bullies by being something of a pint-sized brawler. Even if you don't quite win a fight, you can still inflict a fair amount of damage, and after that, suddenly they don't want the smoke anymore. So it was honestly only a matter of time before I snapped at Josh. Sure, he was bigger than me, but I was about perfectly positioned to nail one good punch to the balls, and after that there was little chance he'd want to lay hands on me again. Anyway, it's getting closer and closer to Halloween, and some of the bullying is getting pretty intense, and I said each time something happens, I get more and more furious. Up until the point where, on the morning of Halloween, me and my friends are talking about going trick-or-treating that evening, swapping costume ideas and stuff, when Josh appears like out of nowhere and starts verbally pounding on us about how we're such a bunch of nerds. I think it was how he was trying to show me up in front of my friends that really did it. I just couldn't stand the thought of losing face in front of them, so I clapped back with like, Yeah, but your mom loves it when I dress up for her. Josh just stops dead, like this blank expression on his face. My buddies are all laughing like, Got him, and I'm half expecting Josh to start trying to pummel on me, but he doesn't move. He just stares off into the near distance for like a full minute while I look back at him in confusion. Then, without a word in reply, Josh just storms off without so much as looking at us, but before he disappears around a corner, he full on throws a right hook into a locker so hard he put a dent in the thing. Just like boom, punches it so loud a teacher comes out from a class screaming and asking what was that. It felt kind of good knowing I'd gotten them so mad, even if I probably would end up suffering for it. But just how much I'd suffer for it, I had absolutely no idea. So cut to a, like an hour or two later and we're all having lunch, sitting around the tables just minding our own business. One by one, seniors start coming up to our table like, Did you really say that stuff to Josh about his mom? And when I say yes, they're all like, Wow, dude. Just, Wow walking away shaking their heads and laughing. This happens like a bunch of times too, and at first I think they're just impressed that I flamed the bully so hard, but there's something else there too, something that kind of piqued my curiosity. So, in the end, when this one senior kid asks what I'd said, I stopped and was like, why is that such a big deal? Guy had it coming. Yeah, but you brought up his mom, the kid replied like it wasn't what kids always bring up against each other when they're trading insults. I'm like, so what? Your mama jokes are like old news by now. The kid then looks at me like I just told him I thought the earth was flat. Dude, Josh's mom died over summer break. Sudden cancer diagnosis or something. It was brutal. It's hard to even sum up the mix of emotions I felt in that moment. Like I felt like a douche. Bully or no bully, losing your mom like that must be one of the worst things that can ever happen to a person, and to remind him of it made me feel terrible. Then, having not known, that just made me feel so out of the loop, just like an outsider or something, like I had no place being there, which was already bad enough considering my physique. But what really overwhelmed me was the fear I felt, knowing I would made him so unbelievably furious. The locker punch suddenly made all the sense in the world, and I imagined the kind of revenge I'd personally want if someone made fun of my dead mom like that. Suddenly a few crotch punches didn't seem like such an effective deterrent. Josh would be wanting to tear me apart. I managed to duck him for the rest of the day. For a while I was actually debating whether or not I should actually just bite the bullet and apologize to him. A little empathy might have been good for all involved, and it's not like I would be doing so just to save my own skin, like I genuinely felt bad about having said what I said. But I guess I was just too cowardly to actually seek him out, 
and doing so seemed like a dumb move on my part when it would just be easier to ninja around school and bail when the final bell rang, which is exactly what I did, then just headed home in the hopes that a little trick-or-treating fun would be exactly what I needed to take my mind off the whole thing. Besides, it was a Friday and whatever was going to happen over the mom insult fiasco was at least going to have to wait until Monday. I'd gotten myself what was essentially a stay of execution. So like I said, that night was Halloween and me and a few buddies had planned on going trick-or-treating together. It was a good time, I mean, anything involving free candy always makes for a good time, right? And the night was going smoothly, right up until we stop at a crosswalk where this car is pulling up. The car stops, and we step out into the street as we start to walk in front of it. Then right as we're on a level heading with it, one of my buddies is like, Don't look, dude. Under his breath, nudging me and pointing towards the car. And naturally I look. Big mistake. Because who sat in the driver's seat of that car cruising around on Halloween night with his buddies? Of all the people on the face of earth that I really, really didn't want to run into that evening, it had to be them sitting in their car at the crosswalk. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. It was the slab of meat, Josh. And right then, as I'm perfectly positioned in front of his car, we lock eyes with one another. Obviously, I'm wearing a costume, but no mask. So although it takes him a minute of being like, why does this little runt seem familiar to me? He does actually recognize who I am. Now, I knew he was going to be mad, but I didn't expect him to be this mad because as soon as it hits him that it's me walking in front of the car, he guns his engine and just lurches forward, actually trying to straight up run me and my friends over. We manage to run out of the way just in time, and he heads up the street while onlookers are like, oh god, did you see that? Those poor kids almost got hit, and stuff, while we watch from the sidewalk as he does a very illegal U-turn before coming right back at us. We just start running down the sidewalk trying our very best to escape but the dude was in his car so we stood absolutely no chance of getting away from him. Josh just guns it past us, cutting off our route of escape then jumps out of the car to give chase. It was a big dude, but Jesus Christ was he fast. So needless to say, he catches up to me in like no time at all and just tackles me down onto the sidewalk. Then as you can probably guess... Josh then proceeds to beat the goo out of me, with me shouting, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't know the whole time. Like he's just raining blows down on me, kicking me while I'm balled up on the sidewalk, when I hear something I still feel kind of conflicted about. He's grunting and cursing at me for a while, but then I hear something else. He's like whimpering or something as he's hitting me. Then his voice starts to break while he's calling me all kinds of names, and I come to realize that he's actually crying. It was weird. I could have at least tried to get up and make a run for it, but I didn't. I just shut up and let him wail on me for a while because honestly, I felt like I kind of deserved it. I know that probably sounds really dumb. He was a bully, and he's probably still a bully now, but yeah, there it is. I just felt really, really sorry for the guy. No one deserves to lose their mom like that. No one. He only stops beating on me when he's actually full-on ugly crying, then he heads back to his car and just drives off into the night. My trick-or-treating partners had long since ran off, leaving me alone and bloodied on the sidewalk, trying and failing a few times to find my feet. I mean, I didn't blame them. Hearing that car engine revving behind us was one of the scariest experiences of our lives, but yeah, I was all alone at that point, so like I said... It took me a while to be able to stand up enough to start my walk home. But not until I gathered up some of the candy that had spilled out of my sack during the beatdown, which was going to be badly needed for some soul-soothing that night. I snuck in, dodged my parents, and told them the next morning that my bruises were just down to us play-fighting and trying the kind of stuff that you don't try at home was all about. Mom was mad, but it meant I didn't have to tell them something that I was deeply ashamed of. Yeah, maybe it was like an unprovoked thing. Just Josh being the monster that he was. I'd have to tell them the truth, but given the circumstances, it had probably come out that I had insulted this kid's dead mom, in which case I wouldn't have a leg to stand on. But there it is. 
It was the scariest thing to happen to me for that Halloween and really any Halloween to come after. And the bullying didn't stop, but then again, when does it ever? I love running. I'm not, like, competitive about it or anything, but I've been doing some casual 5Ks and 10K runs for a few years now, and I find it's a great way to stay slim and maintain my mental health. But about this time last year, I started to get a weird tight pain in my lower back whenever I was running. Turned out I had a kind of stress injury from a strength imbalance and would need a little bit of rehab to get over it. So all throughout the month of October, I stuck to a course of various strengthening exercises that were designed to help me build up my core and my glutes. It was hard going, and like a lot of injuries like mine, there was no quick fix to get me running properly again. It was a hard road of rehab and disappointment, which left me feeling pretty anxious and depressed. And it all kind of culminated on Halloween of last year, when I went for a run which left my back pretty messed up. I usually run around a big loop of a local park, which happens to border a lot of housing and neighborhoods. What's more, the city council holds a few Halloween events in the park itself, some for kids, some for big kids. So naturally, the place is absolutely teeming with nightlife on the evening in question, which made for a particularly interesting Halloween run. But the joy of slaloming around kids dressed in their spooky best was quickly overshadowed by the pain that began to burn in my lower back. It got progressively worse until after a measly 3.1 kilometers, I was forced to stop, limping my way along the outside path of the park, feeling shamefully defeated. Then right as I'm walking past this group of trick-or-treaters who were apparently old enough to be able to trick some poor off-licensed worker into selling them a few bottles of lager each, one of them makes some daft comment. Look at this idiot over here, one of them says. Looks like he just soiled himself. They all burst into juvenile laughter. Now, running usually makes me pretty zen, so any other time, I might just let a comment like that slide. Only that time, I'm in absolutely no mood to be spoken to like that. So obviously, I come back, hard, deliberately shoulder-barging the gobby offender on the way past him and telling him he'll be picking up his teeth with broken fingers if he keeps up that lip. Look, I'm not some hard case, but... I had a really tough time that month, and I was really, really pent up from not being able to run properly. Remember I mentioned how it was good for my mental health? Yeah, that. Well, these kids were about 16 or 17 at the most, just about the right age to be put back in their place by someone older than them, only it turned out I was seriously misjudged their level of bravado, especially given the amount of Dutch courage that their bottles of lager had given them. So instead of just taking it on the chin and carry on walking in the opposite direction, the group of teenagers then turn around and start following me. Little side note here, I've seen a lot of Amara bottles type out, you what mate, as a funny way to mimic British parlance, I'll admit, it is amusing, but when we've got a group of drunk teenagers following you actually shouting, you what mate, it's not in the least bit amusing. So there I am. Getting followed around a dark part on Halloween by a bunch of costume teenagers who are now intent on kicking my head in, and any potentially deterring witnesses are quickly dwindling. A trio or so of them wouldn't have been a problem, but like I said, there was more than a handful of these little buggers, meaning that if they actually plucked up the balls to do something about it, they could actually do me a fair bit of damage. Only there was one big problem. If they did happen to go on the offensive... It wasn't like I was in the condition to be able to actually run away from them. In fact, in that current state, I wasn't in the condition to be able to maintain a steady pace either. They were gaining on me pretty quickly, and as I said, the little gobby one was definitely keen to save some face. So, I kept plowing on, just sort of hoping that if they did attack, I'd have caught my breath enough to be able to properly defend myself. Only right when I do start feeling back to my best, the jibes from behind me stop and when I actually look over my shoulder to see if they're still following me, I don't see a thing. Now I don't want to give those little toe rags too much credit here, but having them just straight up disappear from behind me was legit unnerving. 
They really did, just up a ninja out of sight somehow, and aside from a nearby tree line, there really weren't many places to hide. I scanned the dark spaces between the aforementioned trees for a minute or so, but didn't see anything obvious. And once I figured I was alone again, I kept on walking back to my flat. But again, like some proper horror movie, there was once or twice on the way back that I thought I heard something rustling in the bushes nearby, or thought I saw something darting among the trees nearby. It was definitely unnerving, yeah, but I really did just put it down to my imagination. Besides, how psychopathic and predatory would these kids have to be to successfully stalk me through a park like that? They were drunk teenagers, not the offspring of Michael Myers. I thought I was just losing it, but in the end, I ended up wishing that was the case. Because right as I walked onto the streets where I lived, got to my flat and turned up the path, I heard footfalls scrambling behind me. I turn to look behind me and my vision just goes white. When I come to, I'm lying in my pathway, hearing the sound of glass shattering and teenagers screaming. I try to look up to see what's going on, but I can't see out of my left eye at all. It felt hot and sticky, and for a moment, I thought it might be altogether gone. That's when the panic hit and I tried to bring myself to my feet, when another blow to my head from a foot or a fist sends me collapsing back onto the gravel. That's what you get, I hear this squeaky little voice yelp. And now we know where you live. They didn't quite know where I lived. They ended up breaking the window of one of my neighbors, which obviously they weren't too happy about. But they did end up breaking my orbital socket, which kept me in a hospital overnight. But since the house we were in had no CCTV and there was basically no witnesses who could identify the kids in question, they pretty much got away scot-free with it. But honestly, that wasn't even the worst part about it. A skull fracture was bad, sure, but that healed with time. What didn't get any better was these kids hanging around outside my flat for months on end, pretty much every night until the wee small hours of the morning. No matter how often we phoned the police and got them dispersed, there was pretty much nothing they could do about them coming back, and the more we called, the less they were interested in actually doing their jobs. I expected the kids to actually attack me again, but they didn't. They ended up doing some considerable more damage to my car once they worked out which one was mine. Not particularly scary, I know, but the bill for getting the scratches out of the paintwork was. It just ground me down over time, though. Messing with my sleep, my mental health. Everything just slowly turned to torture after the attack. So I ended up moving out, and that did solve everything. And I know they're just teenagers, and I bet there's a hundred of you sitting there like, oh, I'd have power bomb that kid right then and there. You're just a little baby for letting them stitch you up like that, but I don't care. You get yourself into a position where these feral, bloody teenagers want your blood? Minds of children, but bodies of full-grown blokes? The fear is very, very real. It's Halloween night of 2007, and me and my little circle of friends are all serious horror fanatics. We've just gotten done watching that Rob Zombie remake of Halloween at a local movie theater, having been snuck into a showing of it by my older sister's boyfriend, even though we were way too young to be in there. It's not a brilliant movie, I guess, but we didn't care, because we're about to go trick-or-treating in a neighborhood where Halloween is a huge deal. Every kid for miles around was going to be walking the streets in their spookiest costumes, streets that were decked out in decorations so lavish that it'd make even the wealthiest theme parks blush. The parents in our area seemed to turn the whole thing into something of a competition, which made for a very, very spooktacular atmosphere. Needless to say, we were pumped. We all make our way back to our various parents' house, put on our different costumes, and then meet up at the end of our street to begin our undead shuffle around the neighborhoods. It was honestly one of the most memorable nights of my life. I can barely describe the kind of youthful excitement that possessed us that evening. It was absolutely electric. And since our costumes were tip-top, we absolutely cleaned up on the candy front. Some houses we called at gave us a few extra handfuls because we were just so excited to be trick-or-treating. At one point, 
one of my friends hid just out of view from the door of the house that we knocked on. Some mom and dad couple answered the door, smiling and wishing us an enthusiastic happy Halloween after we gave them our best trick-or-treat. Then, just as they're about to give us a handful of fun-sized candy bars, my friend jumps out at them from around the corner, wearing his awesome-looking werewolf mask and makes the loudest howling noise you could ever wish to hear from a 14-year-old kid whose voice hadn't quite dropped yet. The dad of the couple is absolutely scared out of his skin, backing off from the doorway with this girlish wah-sounding scream. The mom freezes for a second, all wide-eyed and shocked before she just bursts out laughing at her husband's reaction. The dad's all like, "That you kid, you scared the life out of me, man but kind of starts cracking up too, which then just makes the mom laugh even more. Everyone is laughing to themselves at this point. It's a super wholesome moment, and it's something I'll remember fondly for the rest of my life. And thanks to the efforts of our werewolf buddy, we each got an extra handful of fun-sized bars in our candy sacks. It was a win-win scenario. So a little while later, we're all walking around still, our candy sacks absolutely stuffed with goodies that are probably going to last until December if we ration them right, and if we keep the stashes well hidden from the sticky fingers of our older siblings. We're not entirely bored yet, but the conversations have started wandering way beyond where we might be able to hit the mother load of candy next. That's when someone brings up a particularly scary story. I don't mean, ooh, super spoopy skeleton story. I mean like legit terrifying. One of my buddies starts telling me the urban legend of the evil woman who got so sick of trick-or-treaters knocking on her house on Halloween that she gave them all poisoned candy and ended up killing a bunch of kids as a result. Scary enough, considering what we were doing, but totally not true, right? Wrong. Another of my buddies is all like, nah dude, that's, that's a true story and tells us how that stuff actually happened like back in the 80s or something. Apparently, and I did look this up myself later on to confirm it, this poor kid gets given a poisoned pixie stick while on his trick-or-treating rounds. He eats the candy inside, totally unaware of the sugar crystals inside are actually laced with cyanide. Yep, cyanide. Like one of the deadliest poisons known to man, same stuff Hitler swallowed to end his own life at the end of World War II. Then boom, the kid froths at the mouth and dies. It was no urban legend at all. That stuff legit happened for real. Then our buddy goes on to tell us that it wasn't some evil old lady that did the poisoning. It was his own dad that did it for some insurance thing. Like he took out life insurance on his kid, murdered him, then tried to claim on it. Sick, right? Seriously disturbing story and obviously we're all actually terrified by the prospect of it. We're walking along actually wondering aloud to each other if we'd called at anyone's house who seemed weird enough to actually do that. There was no seemingly evil old ladies that night but one of us starts joking that maybe, just maybe, the dude who we'd scared was actually angry at us and the extra candy that we'd been given had been laced with something to get revenge spooky prospect, I'm sure you'll agree, but a dumb one nonetheless. No one would actually lace candy with poison and give it to kids, which someone actually says aloud at one point. Then not 20 minutes later, we decided to dip into our candy halls a little early to sample some of the evening's well-earned delights. We're all chowing down when, suddenly, my buddy Tyler starts telling us how he doesn't feel so good. He hadn't eaten any candy up until just a few moments before, so it's not like he could have had a stomach ache from that. We're asking him if he's okay, if he needs to sit down, and if we need to get him some water from a nearby house or something. But he can barely respond other than to tell us that he feels dizzy and wants to go home. He then walks over to the curb and almost collapses down onto the grass, beginning to violently cough as he does so. And that's when he starts getting scared. I remember being all like, Come on, man, stop faking it, dude. This isn't funny. Stop it. But he doesn't stop. And deep down, I could tell he wasn't faking it. I, I can't feel my tongue, he suddenly says, and my heart just stopped in my chest. All I could think about was the candy poisoning story, 
Hell, we'd been unlucky enough to actually run into someone evil enough to give us candy that had been laced with something toxic, or maybe even deadly. Oh my god, dude, it's poison candy, I remember saying out loud, which was incredibly stupid because not only did the three of us who were okay start to lose our minds out of fright, but Tyler started seriously panicking too, which obviously made his symptoms worse. Then, unbelievably, I actually watched as Tyler's face started to go all red and swell up, like his head was on its way to exploding right in front of us. One of us had ran off to get some help from a nearby house by then, though, banging on the front door and screaming for help as the rest of us watched Tyler hold his stomach and begin retching. We told him that he'd be okay, that we'd get him some help, but honestly, I thought I was going to watch one of my best friends die that night, murdered at the hands of some mystery poisoner who would probably get away with the crime and go on to kill countless others. I imagined this mass funeral of kids from our town all victims of the Halloween Poisoner. The national press would get involved, the FBI. It would all go on for weeks and weeks while the town mourned the largest mass poisoning in the history of the USA. That's all that was rushing through my 14-year-old head. Pure terror and speculation. But I mean, could you believe me? I was literally watching my friend's head swell up right before my very eyes. And then, Tyler passed out. He was just that, unconscious, but I thought he was dead, and I was holding back, whimpering in tears by the time a pair of grown-ups ran out from the house nearby before running back inside to call 911. It was a terrible scene after that. A big crowd gathered to watch, even more showing up and gawking at the morbid scene when the ambulance showed up and stretched Tyler into the back of it. We couldn't go with him to the hospital not realizing that the paramedics could find a way to contact Tyler's mom and dad once they had his name, which he had obviously given them, we were devastated at the idea of having to call round at their houses to tell them the horrible, horrible news that their son had died in front of us. It was horrendous, truly horrifying, and one of the most memorable nights in my life suddenly got so much more memorable, but for all the wrong reasons. We headed over to Tyler's parents' house, but no one was home. We thought we'd been spared the job of breaking the awful news to them, but in actual fact, they had already gotten the call that Tyler was at the hospital and had headed over to be with him. I told my parents what happened when I got home. Through ugly tears, I described the dizziness, the coughing, the wheezing, and the puking. My mom, who used to be an EMT back when she was in college, gave me this weird, knowing look then headed off to get in touch with Tyler's parents while I went up to my room and cried myself to sleep. I was shaken awake a few hours later by my dad, who had some news for me. Some good news. Tyler wasn't dead, and neither was Poison the reason why he'd had the terrible episode on the curb that night. You see, Tyler had an allergy, specifically to gelatin, something which is found in a lot of candies, cakes, ice creams, and yogurts. Tyler knew not to eat anything like that and had to agree to go through his candy hall with his parents later that evening so they could weed out anything that might give him a reaction. But what he didn't know, what I didn't know, and what many of you there might not know, is that some cereals contain gelatin. Yep, cereals. God knows how or why that might be the case, but it is. So as it turns out, Tyler sifted through his candy and found some chocolate cereal bar type thing and assumed that he could eat it. Fun fact, Tyler also checked the label himself to see if the thing contained any gelatin but didn't realize that some products use different types for gelatin, things like hydrolyzed animal protein, collagen hydrosylate, or denatured collagen. Obviously, 14-year-old Tyler was not a nutritional scientist and had no idea that these terms were pure semantics and that he was eating gelatin. But still, Tyler could have gone into anaphylactic shock. His throat could have closed over and he could have suffocated, right? Again, wrong. He was never in any real danger of this happening because only rarely does an allergic reaction to gelatin do that. Very rarely. Not like nut allergies, which can actually straight up kill you. Tyler just got taken to the hospital, given some antihistamines, and was kept overnight so the doctors could monitor his condition. So, in the end, everything was okay. No one died, 
and there was no mass poisoning in our town that year, but still. What happened that night was one of the most horrible events of my entire childhood, and I'm pretty sure you can all understand why. I was about 14 years old when my family had just moved to a new town. I was also lucky enough to make a fast friend at my new school and we subsequently made plans to go trick-or-treating together since it was coming up to Halloween night. Because we were 14 and lived in a fairly safe neighborhood, my parents told us that they didn't think I needed a chaperone that year. So while everything was going great and we were having fun, getting some solid candy, it was kind of cool just walking around on our own, feeling sort of grown up. We knock at one house and this middle-aged man opened the door. He seemed happy to see my new friend and me, so I assumed we were in for some grade A candy. I don't actually remember what candy he handed out, but I do remember what happened next. He asked us to come inside, which is weird, but we really wanted candy, so I guess we were dumb enough to take the bait. He disappears for a moment, and... I kind of assumed that he was going to get us some candy, but when he re-emerges, he doesn't have any, only a camera in his hand. Then he asks if he could take a couple of pictures of us, explaining that he liked to take photos of kids every Halloween because he loved seeing the costumes, how he was something of a collector. At this point, even being a fairly naive 14-year-old, I got weirded out, yet knew it was best not to upset the man and let him take the picture and then we could leave. So he takes the photo of us, waits for the Polaroid to come out, then hands us a pen, asks us to sign our names on the back. Me and my new friend did as we're told, but although we'd been dumb enough to actually go into this guy's house with him, we weren't dumb enough to sign our actual names, so we wrote fake ones on the back just to satisfy him. Only then were we allowed to leave with the candy that he gave us after we signed. I don't know if this guy was on some sort of list or some sort of offender or anything like that. There were no more run-ins with him and nothing in the way of rumors going around town. But I still get creeped out thinking about what he did with that photo of me. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, keep your piggies clean. <laughs>